Our sec second scripture reading is from the book of John, chapter 17, verses 20 through 26. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. When I started, <laughs> when I started doing this 38 years ago, the only thing you had to worry about was, was your zipper pulled up before you stood in front of a whole group of people. <laughs> 38 years now later, I have to make sure my hearing aids were charged and then I put them in. Got to make sure that the, the pacemaker is working the way it's supposed to, and now I walk into this building and I got an extra button to push. I don't know. <laughs> don't know. Can we start with a word of prayer? Lord God, because of me or in spite of me, I ask that you speak through me and let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and our minds be acceptable in your sight. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you follow the church calendar, you know that today is Ascension Sunday. So what the heck does that mean? We seem to be getting away from that annual cycle of events and it's becoming centered on just Easter and Christmas. But this is an important day and it's a day that uh, the scriptures that we read today allude to. Jesus praying to the Father, saying, I want to make sure they've got it. I want to make sure they understand that, uh, that they're one with me now. I want to make sure that I've done the job that you sent me to do. Uh, remember that after Easter, he came back and, and there's the illusion that he wanted to continue in the teaching with the disciples so that they had the ability to go out after him and to share the good news. Sometimes we don't even know what the good news is anymore. He, he wanted to make sure that the disciples were able to, to go wherever they felt called to go and to share the fact that God loves each and every one of us enough that if we believe, we might be saved. And the question often comes up, saved from what? I, I didn't realize I was lost. But if we search our own hearts, we know that, well, that each one of us in this building and each one of us around the world has participated in sins in a variety of different ways. In 38 years of doing pastoral ministry, I've yet to met a person face to face that said to me, 
you know, I haven't done anything wrong. I haven't had a single wrong thought cross my mind. I can go to the beach at Ocean City and look at those girls wearing almost nothing and have an impure, without having an impure thought. I can go to the gym and look at those guys with big bulging muscles and, and it's okay. I don't have to think about anything else. I've never had a person say to me, they don't have anything to be saved from. Oh, and by the way, I just thought of this. Nathan did an excellent job. I had no idea until this morning that he was related to this guy. <laughs> and one more thing, just a total aside. I think when I met Bill, he was Nathan's size, and now I understand about these potluck suppers. <laughs> you need to be careful, young man. <laughs> Were any of you born, I guess some of you were born before me. You, how many were alive in the 70s? <laughs> it, well, it's not a hard question. <laughs> now, how many of you remember the 70s? There's, a, there's more hands. Some of you weren't missing. <laughs> Usually hands drop at that point and I make a inappropriate joke about why we don't remember them. But I won't do that today. In, in 1972, because I'm being high tech now. My wife taught me this last night. In 1972, there was a, a song that came out. It was a popular song. It was written by a guy named Gilbert O'Sullivan. You remember Gilbert? A couple of you do. He was an Irishman that came to the United States, and he had four or five hits in the 70s, and he wrote one called Alone Again Naturally. And it goes, I'm gonna just read parts of it. It's too big. <laughs> to think that only yesterday I was cheerful, bright, and gay. Gay meant something different back then. Looking forward to who wouldn't do the role that I was about to play, but as if to knock me down, reality came around. And without so much as a mere touch, cut me into little pieces, leaving me to doubt. Talk about God and his mercy. Well, if he really does exist, why did he desert me? In my hour of need, I truly am indeed alone again, naturally. I've met a lot of people in 38 years of pastoral ministry who have told me, though, that they felt alone again. The disciples had just experienced the resurrection of Jesus some 42 days or so prior to this day of ascension. They'd gathered in the uh, upper room. They'd spent a period of mourning they saw the image of Jesus walk through a wall in, in a way that they never expected to happen. Their sense of aloneness went away. They realized there was something more to come, and Jesus' words told them that. And they were excited. And then those days changed a little bit. After knowing that there was power promised, after knowing that their mourning didn't have to take place, after knowing that Jesus had prayed to the Father that the ministry continue, they went out with him and watched him rise to heaven. And I wonder how many of them didn't think the thought as they saw the, the body rise up, alone again, naturally. I wonder after all the times of Peter arguing with Jesus and the disciples arguing amongst themselves of who was going to be the greatest, I wonder if they looked ahead and thought, am I going to be able to continue doing this? We know that some of them said it's time to go back for fishing, to, to fish for fish this time, not to fish for men. And I wonder if they had the foresight to look ahead at the responsibilities that Jesus had placed on their shoulders to, to be able to go and, and share the word to, 
to all nations and, and to baptize those in all nations. I, I wonder if they didn't concern themselves with the thought of being alone again, naturally. Even an environment with other disciples around him, and not just those core disciples, but all those others that had heard the words of Christ and from the very beginning followed, if they didn't in the midst of a crowd at times feel alone again naturally. Sometimes as human beings, we tend to feel that way. In the midst of gatherings, we wonder what our purpose is. In the midst of a crowd, we wonder what is it that, that Christ wants us to do? How do we fit into this ministry that we were baptized in, that, that we made a verbal commitment to? Paul says in another place, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you're going to be saved. How many times do we wonder based on the actions of those that we see around us, whether it be in church or, or outside after that hour of Sunday worship together, do we wonder whether or not we're alone again? Oftentimes, because as human beings, we become well, judgmental. We look at somebody that does something in a different manner than we do, and, and we're not happy. I wonder what that jailer felt like when he had Paul and Silas arrested and, and then experienced the great earthquake, being the jailer that he was and apparently a responsible person to his job. He went out and looked, and the gates were down. And his first thought seems to be, I'm alone here. What am I going to do? But the integrity of Paul and Silas allowed Paul to speak out and say, you're not alone. We haven't gone anywhere. We're still here. Earlier in John's gospel, then the part that we read in chapter 17, Jesus says, I'm going to go away for a period of time to prepare a place for you. And if I, go away, if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come back so that you might be with me. It's during that time when he's away and preparing that we're most apt to ask, am I alone now? Is, is this the natural way for it to be? Do the responsibilities of sharing Christ fall on my shoulders just on my shoulders, this short, fat, 63-year-old guy who's been doing this longer than anything else he's been doing in his life, is it my responsibility? And then I, I look at young guys like Bill. You're younger than me. And, and I say, well, thank goodness there's some people coming behind Sometimes I question what they're learning in seminary now, but that's because they're just not like me. And I know that I'm not alone because there's others out in the field doing the work, telling the jailers, don't be afraid, because what you need to do to be saved is really simple. It's to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I take it that some of you guys just went through confirmation? Yeah, okay. And, and were you told that the only way to be saved was to go through confirmation? Good. <laughs> well, because sometimes as, as religious organizations, we put all of these extra requirements that you don't find anywhere in the scripture. And then it gets to that point of making a decision and you wonder, do I really want to go to six weeks or 36 weeks or 50? I have no idea which mission material you use. Nine weeks? Okay. Nine months. Nine months. Gosh, I'd be Baptist. Um, <laughs> I didn't say that. 
Do I really want to commit that much of myself? Do I really want to go out into the world and have responsibility for others? When somebody said, am I my brother's keeper at the beginning of the scripture? You remember the Cain and Abel story? You remember that? Do I really want to be my brother's keeper or my sister's keeper? That's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. Do I really need to come to church every Sunday? I hops right down the street and make good pancakes in the morning. Do I really want to put a tenth of everything that I earn in that offering box in the back? I'm amazed you guys have the faith to do that and are able to meet your budget. That's just a wonderful thing. Do I want to commit who I am before I can accept the love of Jesus Christ? You don't have to. You don't have to. When the jailer asked, what do I need to do to be saved? Paul told him, that's it. That's it. There's no sinner's prayer in the Bible. There are no steps and hoops that you have to go through. It doesn't even say you have to know the scriptures. It surely doesn't say you have to go to nine months of confirmation class. But it doesn't even say you have to be confirmed. And it doesn't say you have to be baptized, although we find that, that those that do recognize their salvation choose to be baptized as a response to God's work in their lives. It became an easy thing for the jailer and his family to say, this is what I want. This is who I want to be, not alone again, but with a group of people that spans the globe, that know that Jesus loves them, not because of what they do, but because he created them. Not because of who they might be, not because of the car they drive or the house that they live in, not because of which other charities they participate in, but because they recognize that Jesus Christ is the savior of the world. And surely he loves us all because he's the only one that can create us all and did do that. In our times of despair, which if I had read all the words to that song, even if that despair leads to the point of thinking about taking ourselves out of this world, if you know that song, you know it's about a guy that was jilted at the altar by his girlfriend and he thinks he's going to do something for himself, and the second or third line says, I think I'll go visit a nearby tower. Well, that seems like weird words, and jump off, because I'm so alone. We don't need to be that alone ever, because surely as God is with us, and surely the Holy Spirit nurtures us, and surely Gilbert's words were wrong. We never have to be alone, naturally. Amen.